Once a year, I get to repeat myself a little bit when we talk about the core values, who we are as a church, what we feel church really should look like. Not my opinion, not my taste or preference, but what the Bible says, what God says, what Jesus says his church should look like. Let me ask you a question. It's on the screen in just a second. What, uh, there it is. What, why, what, why didn't you go to church? Some of us have been in church before Jesus, haven't you? you know, some of us have been doing this a long time. Some of, some of us, you know, it's a recent thing. Uh, fill in the blank. I didn't go to church because, or I don't go to church because. We can be honest today. Shout out. Shout out. You can be honest. I'm not going to insult anybody unless you say there's a big fat woman on the stage <laughs> that was rubbish. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, I, I, don't, I didn't go to church. Or I don't go to church because. Shout out. Stereotypes. Stereotypes. Yeah, yeah. That sort of stuff on, the sta- on there, yeah. Come on. You didn't think it was for you. And you do now? I do. Well, there we are. There's a result. <laughs> Music's too loud. Music's too loud. <laughs> for some folks, yes, it is. It's not, it's not, we're not shouting out our own personal complaints here today. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> not my cup of tea. It's not my cup of tea. Um, why, don't, why didn't you go to church? What stopped you? Sorry, somebody said something. The singers were out of tune. That's just rude. That is, that's just rude. Eh? Scared, scared to go back. Scared to go back. Yeah. Not. I didn't. You didn't feel good enough. Yeah. People don't feel good enough. Shout out, guys. I'm deaf. This whole kind of condemnation thing and judgment and you're just going to feel unworthy and all of that. Yeah, anything else? Nobody ever asked you. Nobody asked you. That's another thing, isn't it? Because often we feel like we need to be invited. Ernest? I'm busy. Okay, so, okay, brilliant. Any, anything else? Anybody else? There's also all, all sorts of reasons why we don't do church. There's a whole bunch of there, and there's whole other things that we could perhaps think on. Boring. It's old. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable pews. You know, um, it's old-fashioned. It's, I, I feel inadequate. Somebody said that, basically. I wasn't good enough. I'm, I'm too busy. I play football on a Sunday morning. There's all sorts of reasons why. I'm afraid to sit in someone else's seat. You know, I tried that once, and they virtually beat me out of the building. You know, you know how bad was that? You know, I don't want to be Doc Cotton, if that's what a Christian looks like. I don't want to be Doc Cotton off EastEnders, miserable old bag she was. Uh, you know, full of hypocrites. That's another thing, isn't it, that people think church is. So what changed? Look at you. Some of you are in here for all sorts of reasons, and some of you have been in a long time. Some of us have just turned up today, and look at you. What happened? I hope that if you were to slice us as a church, Bethel Church Albury through, um, like an apple, uh, please try, don't try to do that. Uh, at our core, I hope you'd find five things, five simple things that are really foundational, not only to us, but were foundational to the first church, the first ever church 2,000 years ago in Acts 2, which is a, a book of the Bible. The DNA of Jesus' hope for his church. We hope that you'd find a community of imperfect. We've got a sign that we put up sometimes, no perfect people allowed, because we're full of, a church full of imperfect people, and we're quite aware of that. Uh, but we're loved and we're forgiven by God. People who are authentic uh, in our worship. And when I say worship, I, I mean the way that we follow Jesus, not just for two hours or an hour on a Sunday morning doing a bit of this and a bit of, hey God, I'm here, but people who live it as best they can with God's help. We hope that you find a community of people who, who realise this isn't a club. You know, I, I've, I've been a member of lots of different clubs. Uh, you know, I'd hate for people to think, well, I'm in now. You know, I've, I've done my church bit. I'm in. I've pleased God. I've, I've sorted that out. Uh, you know, I've got enough status. I've, I've got the right handicap. I re- wear the right clothes. Folks, that's the golf club. That's not church. You can come as you are. You know, um, uh, but a golf club exists for its members. The church exists for the people outside of it. The church exists for people in our communities, in our street. It's got to be outward looking. It reaches out to people we do life with, the lost, the last, and the least, with some good news. We all need a bit of good news, especially at the moment. We hope that you see a group of people who are learning to put the all about me 
attitude down and choose a, a unity and grace. Committed to a relationship with God through prayer and encountering his presence and committed to each other instead of doing it alone. Acts 2 has a lot to say about that. Let's hear why some church, some people go to church. Blink and you'll miss it. I go to church when I need, need help and need someone to, to listen to me. Oh, I've always gone to church since I was a kid. Um, to get into the week. I don't go to church. <laughs> Just to fellowship with other people in the same lane as you. Uh, community is a big part of it. I like, I like kind of what it stands for in the sense of the community and kind of what it brings. Even though I'm not a Christian, but I go to church every week because I I just love to be with people there because everyone's so caring about each, each other. I, I was dragged to a church really as a kid, this church, funny enough, and, and I don't think I really knew how good it was. Looking back, I'm glad because I, I, dis, I came to discover that church was never meant to be boring or full of old cranky people or full of young, cranky people, either, I, 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 who don't like kind of anybody else coming into their church. We've all been in churches like that. And I'd hate for people to experience that when they came into this church. Uh, I, it's not about getting on a leadership or a parish council. It's not about being known in a community for who you are. A church is about saying, look, this is who Jesus is, and this is what I've, he's done for me. It's a very different thing, isn't it? As I encountered Jesus, I began to like church. Funny, fancy that, goodness me. And, and nowadays, I actually really love it. I'm really passionate about it. Uh, I still hope that, I still believe that the church is the hope of our world. Look at us. It's a bit hopeless, isn't it? No, it's hopeful. The building's fine, it's, it just facilitates church. It's not about the building. Jesus never built a building. He built a community of people. So when I say church, I mean you lot. Them lot in the Methodists and the Baptists and the Anglicans. They're all part of God's family. The people, the unique journey that you and I have with Jesus, the different styles and expressions that make up this global community called the church. Let me mention three words to you this morning that come to mind to me now when I think about church. Thankfully, it's not boring, I don't feel. Church is friends. Jesus said, didn't he? He says, you are my friends. God calls you friend. Wow, that's quite something. What a privilege. He's not the teacher with the stick, you know, or, or the, the, the kind of ogre up in the sky that we all think, you know, we should carry before if he exists. But he says, I call you friends. That's a massive thing. And as well as developing a relationship with Jesus, uh, with Jesus, Jesus calls us into a, a depth of friendship I've not known anywhere else. Relationship with people that cuts against the privileges and the ages and the ethnicities and the backgrounds and culture. Sometimes that we get pigeonholed into. Like you, I've got some really great pals around. I, I do. I haven't got loads of great pals. I've got lots of acquaintances, but I've got great pals around. And, and, but the best friendships, I think, over the years that have carried me through are the people I've found in a church. They've helped me to grow emotionally and spiritually over the years. We cry together. We, laugh, we have fun together. But they've encouraged me in my relationship with God. And and when I've been a distraction or less enthusiastic, they've challenged me in my attitudes and behavior. they've helped to shape who I am today. The Bible says we can't do Christianity on our dot. Hebrews says, don't give up. Keep meeting up so that you can encourage each other. We need each other, folks. Second word, friends, family. When you become a Christian, the Bible says you're born again. What? is that you know that's a really odd thing to say not physically you understand that would be really gross wouldn't it in fact that would be totally weird uh, but spiritually god reveals himself to us in the bible as dad abba father that's a real that means dad not father like prince charles might have called the prince uh, of whatever prince or oh, the duke wasn't it you know father can you imagine that kind of distance he says call me daddy that's the direct translation from Abba, Father. You, you think your family's big or diverse? 
God's intention is to bring the whole of the human race together as a family, united around his son Jesus. And he calls us his children, not his subjects like the queen might, but his children, sons and daughters. It's like we're adopted into a new family. It's not that we we walk away from our natural families and friends, not at all. In fact, I found over the years that 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 this has helped my family and relationships out there better than if I hadn't got this. But we're adopted into a new family of all ages and all nationalities. His family currently stands at 2.4 billion and it's growing around the world. Ukraine, you'd think it wouldn't be, but it's growing. Church is growing in China where you can get uh, persecuted for being a Christian. It now stands at 100 million people or thereabout. It was only 4 million people in 1940. Africa has grown, uh, the church has grown 3,600%. Man alive, that would be good for your stats at work, wouldn't it? You know, but you see, this isn't an organization, folks, that you join. This is a family where you belong. You feel the difference. You sense the difference. I love church because it's friends. I love church because it's family. And I love church because it's home. It's home. I realize that home isn't always a great place to be for some people. But my experience of home is that it should be a safe place. A base for life where I keep it real. A place where I keep coming back to. It's where I'm uh, me most, if I'm really honest. It's a place uh, I recharge and rest I love to share it with others. I like to invite them around for a meal and, and drinks and just to, just to get to know people better. After a long day of work, after a difficult day of work, after a holiday or a long journey back, there is nowhere quite like home. So being with church for me is, is like my spiritual home. All our lives it can be, be, can't it, that we're like looking for something And no amount of lovely people, amazing stuff, fantastic life experiences, holidays, the works, can fill that need. The Bible calls it a restlessness of our soul. Uh, Jesus says, if you're thirsty, we should go to him to drink. I can drink as much Ribena and everything else that's going, but I will be thirsty again. Yeah, I keep having to turn the tap on. I, I didn't have one drink in 1976 and that was it. I'm still going. I have to keep drinking. And Jesus says, if you're thirsty spiritually, if your soul is thirsty, come to me, he says, and I will give you a, a, a drink, you know, although it's water that you don't need. Um, I'll give you i I'm totally losing myself. I've gone on a tangent, folks. That's the trouble, isn't it? And I will satisfy, he says, your spiritual thirst. People, when they come into church, not just this church, many churches, they will say, it feels like I've come home. I don't get it. I don't understand all of it. I'm a bit of a loss as to what's going on. But something in me feels like I've come home. Their soul's restlessness, the searching, the thirst gets satisfied. Church is home. I would love for everyone to walk through these doors and feel like they're at home. Church, we need to make sure that happens, don't we? As a group of folks that come here regularly, we meet together, we worship, we learn together, we pray together, we eat together, we support each other. We, we go out to work through the week and then on a Sunday or whenever it is that we meet together, we come home. We get restored and refreshed, re-energized for the week. Body, mind, soul. And today, stomach. A place where people are welcomed and not judged, but loved and accepted and welcomed home. I tried to go into a golf club once and they wouldn't let me in because I got shorts on. Now, my legs are not great for anybody to look at, but, you know, they they wouldn't let me in because I hadn't got the right clothes. Look at what we're wearing today, folks. Look at us. We're all so different. It's not about what you're wearing. It's about why you're here. And you are loved, you are welcome, you are accepted in this place. If we believe that God in his generosity and grace has demonstrated an unconditional love and acceptance of us through the cross of Jesus and saved us, it says, while we were still messed up, the Bible says in Romans 5, while we were still sinners, then we have to demonstrate the same. We want to reflect his offer of acceptance and grace and love to people no matter what condition they arrive at our door in. Folks, I don't know what you've come from today. I don't know what kind of life you live. Uh, that's not necessary for me to know. Only you can know what goes on in your, your, your day-to-day. But over, over the years, many people have sat in my office or come into these, this church and other churches I've, walked, I've worked in. I remember this big 
tattooed hell's angel, bearded guy, and he was a real kind of, well, he filled my office, you know. And he dragged his wife in at, to the office in the church. And in his own words, he was a self-confessed pervert. That, I never said, you didn't expect that from the pulpit today, did you? You know, and that was what he said. He, uh, he says, I'm a self-confessed, I, I call myself a self, self-confessed pervert. And he was proud of that. And he says, and you see this, my wife, he said, you see this woman, he said, she's come to church, she says she's a Christian, and now she's refusing to, I, I'm not going to use his words, <laughs> um, but he's basically, ref, she's refusing to sleep with me and half the women in the street. His whole perverted, people using and abusing social life was starting to fall apart. And me... The church was to blame for that. Well, I'll take that, won't you? (laughs) There's a winner. There's a result. Um, But, you know, lots of people come through our doors. And you may be thinking, well, I'm doing all right. Thank you very much. I've got, you know, got my own business. Uh, You know, I could look around the room and, you know, lots of you are doing great. Got loads going on. But we all sat there, haven't we, realizing that there's something not quite enough. William, the sitting renowned drunk. Lovely people who felt welcome. Linda, the toothless, 20 stone prostitute and addict, felt welcome. Started a journey with God. Jackie, the 80-year-old Catholic palm reader, worked that out. Failing students, falling students, frustrated students, frustrated 70-year-olds, all sat in church. Wife beaters, thieves, drug dealers, wealthy, got it all together business owners who need nothing. Got it all. Struggling Christians, church leaders, the local policemen, the PCSO, the trafficked, people struggling with depression, eating disorders, abuse, self-worth issues, adulterous sex offenders, lawyers, medics, children, and social workers trying to cope with the fact that mum and dad are beating each other up. And it's, I could go on and I could go on and go on and go on. And then there's you. And then there's me. With our own unique bundle of stuff. You name it, they've sat in church. People from every extreme of society and everybody in between. I guess we're, lots of us are in between all of that. Everyone is welcome. No matter what label society adorns you with, no matter what you carry today, no matter what you've achieved in life, no matter what you bring to the cross. And Jesus stands before us today, he stands before them today, and he says, you're welcome. God invites you to know him as friend, as father. He invites you to take your seat at his family table. He invites you to come home. My dad always used to say, you can always come home. And God says, you can always come home. Church is a place where everyone's welcome. But it's also a place where everyone is changed. I'm not what I was. For a lot of reasons. Pringles is one of them. (laughs) But also because God is doing stuff in me. It's changing me. See, when you encounter God, you encounter the presence of God, you you can't help but be changed. You can't help but somehow come alive a bit differently or a lot differently because it's like your soul is home. Church, friends, family get to help each other fall into grace and forgiveness. We get to look out for the opportunities he gives us to love, to welcome, to serve, to give, to share our story, to pray to respond to people in need, whatever it takes. And the same change had taken place in the people that made up that first church in Acts 2 all those years ago. The bit at the top is what Luke actually wrote, Dr. Luke, in the book of Acts. But this is what he would have written if there'd been no change, potentially. All the believers were divided. They didn't have much of anything in common. They hoarded their possessions and goods. They kept as much as they could for themselves. Every now and then, if it wasn't football season, I don't know whether they played football in the year dot, um, and they weren't too tired, they'd come to church for an hour and leave early to beat the traffic. They loved Jesus when it was convenient to them, yet they were despised by people for their hypocrisy. What were we saying at the beginning? Why didn't you come to church? Full of hypocrites. And it says very few people became Christians. 
Jesus didn't come to make you and me superhuman, folks. He came to make us super, super, sorry, it's not superhuman, fully human, forgiven, free. And his message of hope is designed to help us to cope with life, not, thrive, not to simply survive, but to thrive. He's the answer to dealing with pressure, fear, guilt, worry, anxiety, failure, pain, all of our hopes and dreams, and making sure it's all in the right box somehow. There's, and there's this little power pat verse in Romans 10 where it says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, changed, healed, changed. See, folks, when we gather as church, when we all enter with stuff. We all enter with a bit of baggage or a lot of baggage. Our biggest achievements, our worst mistakes. We've all got a backdrop, a backstory, haven't we? Anxiety, a pain, a, a hurt, a struggle. We've all got our addictions. Again, I mentioned the blessed word of Pringles, salt and vinegar. If ever you feel, see them on the shelf, then please feel free. Our doubts, our secrets. What this verse is saying, folks, is that when you come in here, you can come as you are. You are so welcome. But Christian or not today, you have an opportunity to cry out to God for his help. That's not weakness. That's not pride. It's what our souls are looking for. To call on the name of God. And when we do that, we can guarantee pretty much that you will change, will, will leave this place changing. You'll leave the church gathered Change somehow, different somehow, new, a restored hope, a different perspective, challenged. You'll be given an opportunity for a fresh start. And it can happen even today for each one of us. You see, the Spirit of God is still involved and in the business of changing people. Not because, you know, he's got it, but because he loves it. And he loves to see people grow and develop into all that they should be in God. We're going to hear more testimonies to that about when we, uh, when we baptise people in, in the autumn just after the summer holidays. Don't miss that Sunday. They're great Sundays, aren't they? He changes the way we see ourselves. He gives us a new identity, new friendships, a new family, a new eternal home. And some changes can happen in our lives really quickly. Others need a secure church family full of gracious people, patient people, forgiving people who are there to walk alongside them. As people have done for you and for me, will you be one of those people that is willing to make sure people feel welcome, and willing to make sure that people come into this place and, and sense the presence of God? You know, so many people, when we sing, they get emotional, and they'll say afterwards, well, what was that about? Well, that's, that's the presence of God. I don't get that when I'm up the Albion, to be honest. Not that I've been up there for a while, but it's not quite the same, is it? God's involved. He's in the mix. He's the reason we're here. Folks, let's continue to make sure we live this 24-7, not just in an hour on a Sunday. To make sure that church is a place, a people, where everyone is welcome and everyone is changing. Does that make sense to you, folks? I hope it, I hope it really does. Would you pray with me? Thank you for listening so well. Jesus, as a community, as a church community, as your disciples, as it were, would you help us to continue to pursue lifestyles of worship and prayer and sharing our faith and building strong relationships with one another? Lord, we want to be the church that you hoped we would be. Father, we do pray that we'd always be a church that welcomes others, no matter who they are or what they've done. We know how that feels. We've been there. May Bethel be a safe place where everyone is changed. A place where people continue to experience the presence and the power of God that transforms and changes lives and homes and mindsets, outlooks, families, behaviours, entire communities for the better. Folks, if church is new to you today, if you've been coming along for a few weeks and you're thinking, oh, I'm not sure still, but... But maybe you, you do, a, I don't know, a couple of weddings, uh, funerals and Christmas. We pray that you know that you're welcome here. And God's offer of friendship, family and spiritual home is yours today. And your response as you've listened and, and tried out church today may be a, no thanks, that's fine. It might be a, a healthy maybe, I think I might try this again. Happy to find out more. Then ask us about the Alpha course. It's really helpful. 
But if something is in you and is whispering in, in the core of your being, this is it. You know when you know her, then I'd love to invite you to say a simple prayer with me, just in the quietness of your heart. It's, a, it's the only way to accept God's invitation and friendship of a place in his family, an eternal home. And you can talk to him now in your own words, if you like, or perhaps I can help you in the quietness of your heart. Simply just say this prayer or something like it after me. Dear God, I, I don't understand it all, but something in me connects with this. I want to respond to your invitation of friendship, family, and a home with a big yes. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins so that I can know you as a friend, but also as a father. I'm sorry I haven't lived my life with you at the center. Please forgive me. I need a new start. Would you come into my life and help me to follow you? Amen.